to Amazonia. Now today's session we're going to be learning all about our nighttime animals. So here in Amazonia we have a different section. For those of you who haven't visited, we've got an area called our nocturnal area which is home to many many nocturnal creatures. Now nocturnal means nighttime. Animals that are nocturnal will wake up at night time and sleep during the day. So generally human beings ourselves unless you work night shifts um, we are called diurnal creatures that means we're awake during daylight hours like it is now. So here in Amazonia through behind me we've got a very dark area and we keep it like this for about 12 hours of the day we've got it as our nighttime area so when our visitors visit they will be in the dark area seeing the animals active because the animals are thinking it's their night time and then late at night about nine o'clock at night for another 12 hours they actually have it as a bright white area so they then have their daytime cycle so it is very important for the animals that we give them both day and night cycles for their body clocks um, otherwise it would be very confusing it would be like us constantly living in the daytime so we're going to head through here we're going to meet some of our creatures much closer. I'm going to tell you all sorts about them. Um, so follow me this way. So here I am in our nocturnal area. So it is a very dark area of Amazonia. There are red lights in the enclosures and in the corridor here for us to be able to see a little bit better. But the animals, their vision is very different. I'll talk about that in a sec. It's very different. So they don't really see the red lights in the same way that we do. But the red lights just enable us to be able to see and find the animals a little bit better. So most of our visitors just need a few minutes to adjust to this area and get used to it to see things. So I'm going to be pointing out quite a few different creatures that we've got in here. Now, last week we did meet um, one animal in here, our group of Cebus fruit bats, um, but we've got quite a few other different creatures that we're going to meet today. So firstly as well, with nocturnal animals, like I've said, their vision is very different to our own. They need to be able to have a vision that allows them to live well at night time, wake up and survive the night of the rainforest. So you will find a lot of nocturnal animals often have very, very large eyes and this helps them to absorb light better and be able to make images in their brain better than what we can with our very small eyes. So nighttime animals often have very large and very dark eyes as well. Often they also might have very large ears so they can listen out for noises. Um, the noises in the rainforest at night can actually be deafening. You might think it goes very, very still and quiet like we're used to at night time. But in the rainforest, many creatures, especially very noisy insects, they come alive. So the rainforest is alive at night and very, very noisy. So thinking about how animals are adapted to live and uh, live in the rainforest and also live at night in the rainforest, I'm going to first focus on an animal called a kinkajou. Now I'm looking around me because I'm stood right by their enclosure and right below a section that they can sort of run over my heads as well. So I'm listening out to see if they come over. They're not down this bit at the moment, I don't think. But the kinkajou, um, it might sound a strange name of an animal. A kinkajou is very similar to a raccoon. It's from the same family as raccoons and coates. They come from South America. They live really high up in the Amazon rainforest. So you'd find them particularly in the canopy layer that we've talked about. And they're extremely good at climbing. Now, this species of animal is what we call an arboreal animal. Now, that means it lives in the trees. It's a tree dweller. So when you hear that word, if an animal is arboreal, you know it lives in the trees. Now, kinkajous are extremely well adapted to living in the trees because they've got four legs. They've got a long tail for balance and other things which I'll come to. Um, and they've got really sharp claws on the ends of their feet as well. So that's really good for holding on, um, climbing up and down the branches. So the kinkajous, with them climbing, they can actually do something very special with their feet. They can turn them backwards so they can run just as fast backwards as they can forwards, which is just an amazing ability to do in the trees. They're also very fast, very good jumpers. They leap across the branches. Um, so really, really well suited to living in the canopy layer. Now, if we do happen to see them 
um, I can point out that they've got these huge eyes, really large dark eyes for the size of their head. So like I said before, this is a, a common feature in nighttime animals, helps them to be able to see a little bit better in that darkness, whereas our eyes just wouldn't have that great ability. So I mentioned the kinkajou's tail. They've got actually a very special type of tail. Um, I'm just waiting to see if Poppy or Forest make an appearance, but they're not doing just yet. But their tail is, it's called a prehensile tail. Now this means that it acts a bit like an extra limb for them. So as they're climbing around in the rainforest at the tops, uh, tops of the trees, they can hold on just with their tail if they want. So in fact, they'll actually dangle just from their tail, special muscles in their tail, allow them to dangle off the branches and eat upside down, which is their favorite way of eating. Uh, you might think it's easier for them to just sit upright and eat, but you'll often see the kinkajous here in Amazonia as well, just dangling upside down. It's thought that if it's a juicy fruit, um, it stops all the juice escaping. It goes all back into their mouth because they're upside down. But um, there, there may be other reasons why they do it as well. So they're very good at dangling down and reaching hard to reach fruits as well. Um, and it is fruits that mainly make up their diet. Fruits, um, vegetation, odd animals as well, odd insects and things. Um, they've also got an extremely long tongue, about five inches long. And this tongue, they can stick into flowers and eat the nectar. They're, they're also a fan of honey. They sometimes have a nickname, honey bear. Um, they're, they're not related to bears at all, but their name honey bear just comes from the fact that they love to raid honeybee nests and eat lots and lots of honey. So here at Amazonia, we have got a honeybee hive outside and when the time of year comes and we extract the honey, it's our kinkajous that are usually first to sample that. So that is a, definitely a treat day for them when that happens. So the kinkajous, as well as having their big eyes for, for the nighttime vision, um, and as well as obviously being able to climb around the trees and being very agile in that sense, um, they've also got a really good sense of smell and sense of hearing as well. Um, it's thought that the kinkajous, they'd be able to even hear just a snake slithering through the bottoms of the rainforest as well. So even with ours here in Amazonia, the slightest of noises, they're listening out, they, they can get quite nervous quite quickly as well. And it's just their instinct, um, their survival mode, just as they would be in the tops of the rainforest. Their sense of smell as well is amazing. You'll see them twitching their noses around a lot, smelling out foods, us as people as well. They're very good at knowing who is who. So even with us as keepers that work with them, um, they will know more, more people more so than others as well. Um, and quickly you know that. So when you see the kinkajous, um, they, do, they are adorable. They look like cute little live teddy bears in a sense, um, but they can be very, very aggressive and temperamental as well. So if they're not sure of surroundings, smells, people around them, etc., um, they will obviously just want to defend themselves. They've got very, very uh, sharp, long canines, um, which I've met a few times. So we just have to be aware of that. You know, they are in captivity, but they, they still act as wild animals, which is fantastic. Um, but we just have to work with caution around that as well. But all these features on them just makes them an amazing animal, um, very, very well suited, uh, designed to live in the tops of the trees at night time in the Amazon. So we're going to now meet a much smaller creature, an invertebrate. So if you remember in the sessions, I've sometimes mentioned those, those are the animals without any bones in their bodies. And we're going to meet one of our eight legged friends, one of our tarantulas. So here's a much smaller nighttime creature that we keep here at Amazonia. This is our chili rose tarantula. Now, many tarantulas will be found in and around rainforests. However, this type, she's, as the name suggests, she comes from Chile, a very thin, long country in South America. And she's actually from more desert and, and scrubland areas, not from tropical rainforests. So a little bit different on the habitat, but she is a nocturnal creature, uh, much more active usually at nighttime, coming out of her little burrow to hunt all sorts of other invertebrates. Um, anything like crickets, locusts, worms, etc. So she's actually the smallest and friendliest kind of tarantula that we find in the world. And you'll see she's now as an adult, about, about well, just a bit smaller than the size of my hand. Um, 
So we keep here in the nocturnal area a variety of different tarantulas. Some are much, much bigger. Um, some are young tarantulas still growing as well. So uh, we're yet to see what size some of those will get to. So like I've said, she will live in a very small burrow. Now tarantulas are one animal that actually don't like a lot of space. We try and give most of our animals space so they can show natural behaviors, uh, they feel comfortable in, they've also got places to hide, etc. But tarantulas, we are much better keeping in very small enclosures and also within those offering lots of hiding places because they'll like to hide under the ground, under rocks, crevices. Uh, we give them plant pots, things like that to hide under. And that's where they feel more comfortable. So only really they're going to be active when they're hunting for their prey. Now you'll see on the tarantula, it's covered in all these tiny little bristly hairs. So this covers all her body, her legs, um, her pedipalps at the front here, they look like legs, but they're like, like us having a pair of arms really, a pair of hands. Um, so over her legs and her body, she's covered in these little hairs. And the tarantulas, they haven't got good eyesight. She's got eight legs and eight eyes. The eyes are right on the top here, all clustered together, but she can't see well at all. So she will actually use all these bristles for picking up vibrations, for anything moving around her, whether it's food or whether it's danger, etc. And if it was food, she can only eat live insects, which she will feel walking towards her. As they walk past her, if she's feeling peckish, she will run in the direction, knowing exactly where it is, and get her teeth into that insect. Now, mentioning her teeth, we can't see them at the moment. She's got two fangs tucked up underneath her body, right at the front. Now, they're not straight teeth, they actually curve around slightly. So at the moment, they're tucked up inside her body. If she was going to use them and pounce on her prey, she would raise her body up, pull her fangs out, and then sink them down into the said insect. So it sounds a little bit gruesome. Um, she uses them a little bit like, um, like straws, really. So she'll keep them in the insect as she's feeding and sort of has an insect soup um, in that sense. So that's how she will catch and eat her food. Now, she will also periodically shed her skin. So like lots of animals, including ourselves, we shed our skin in tiny little bits um, every single day. But some animals will wait and wait and wait. And every few months or maybe every year or so, it depends on the animal and its age, they will shed their skin. So tarantulas are no exception to that. She will when she's ready, she will split open her body all the way down here. She'll actually sit upside down on the ground while she does this. So if you see a tarantula on its back, it's often shedding its skin, um, probably no other issues going on. So she will turn upside down, have her body split open here, and she will literally pull her legs out of her old skin, a bit like you may be pulling your arms out of your jumper or your coat. And when she's out of her old skin, she will look exactly the same. She just needs to wait a few days for her skin to harden up a little bit for better protection. And the skin that she's left behind looks just like her. So often people see it and think it, it's a dead tarantula, but it's not, it's the old shedded skin. And it just allows the spider to, to, grow, uh, to grow bigger. And also it can, basically heal any parts of its body that might have got damaged. So even if they've lost a leg, they can often regrow that leg completely on their next shed, which is, is fantastic for them to do. Now, being a female, she can live an awful long time as well for such a small creature. They can live up to about 20, 25 years, a lot longer than the boys, because once they've mated, the female will usually attack the male and eat him as well. So not, not the best place to be is a male spider. <laughs> so I'll just let her have a little wander on my hand a little bit more. Um, also one thing to point out, the back of her body here, we can't see them just now, but she's got two feelers called spinnerets. And think about the name, spinnerets. This is actually where she spins her web from. So her features are very similar to normal little house spiders we see in and around the house and garden. Um, she's just bigger and hairier. Um, but all these spiders, 
will have these spinnerets which she can put down on the ground where she's moving along and as she moves she will spin her web and a spider's web it's made of silk and it's thought to be one of the strongest materials in the world um, if man could make it into products it's thought to be about 10 times stronger than steel so um, just shows how how amazing nature is um, the things that these small creatures that some people may not often think about either the things they can do um, if we could actually replicate that as, as humans and make it into products um, it would be a fantastic and, and very very strong product as well now she belongs to the group of animals called arachnids so if anybody says that they're frightened of spiders they often say they've got arachnophobia but that could technically mean some other animals that they're frightened of as well and here in the nocturnal area we keep a group of Asian forest scorpions and they are also arachnids they come from the same group as the spiders and one similarity I'm going to talk more about the, the scorpions in a sec but one similarity is that they've got eight legs just like the chili rose tarantula here so I'm going to pop the tarantula away to its enclosure and we're going to have a look at some of our scorpions next so here I am down at our scorpion enclosure these are our Asian forest scorpions so they come from Southeast Asia in the world um, you can see them here but I'm actually going to get one out of its enclosure and we're going to head into the handling room so you can see it much closer they don't always stay too near the front for us here so I'm going to bring them out into the handling room and tell you all about them and their body parts and how, how they survive out in the wild so here we are back in the handling room where we're going to continue on with our weekly map and um, popping the animals on that we've met wherever they're found in the world so with our nocturnal animals today i did talk about quite a bit about the kinkajous definitely one of my favorites although i can't have favorites um, here we've got a little picture of poppy and we're going to pop poppy down here we're, get a, we're gathering quite a few down here in south america let's sit her here between the common marmoset and tortoise there's poppy she should be found in the amazon rainforest and we also met our chili rose tarantula so i've got a little picture of a chili rose here now chili is in a, a slightly different area to these other animals of south america it's a very long thin country comes down the left hand side of south america here so the chili rose isn't really from the rainforest she's from more like deserty drier scrubber scrub areas so we'll sit her down there in the middle of chili so we did also briefly talk about the scorpions now i have actually got a scorpion in here with me i've brought it through from its enclosure and we're going to meet it much much closer and i'll tell you quite a bit more about them so here we are in the handling room and i've brought through one of our asian forest scorpions for you to see a little bit closer and i'll talk about with you and first of all if we have a look on the map i'll just point over to where this one will be found in the world you remember a few weeks ago we met the thorny stick insects um, from southeast asia here and this is the same part of the world that we would find these scorpions living now scorpions belong to the same group of family as tarantulas um, and, and other spiders as well so we met the chili rose tarantula through in the nocturnal area now what makes them very very similar let me just um, get him back on my hand <laughs> uh, what makes them very very similar is the amount of legs they've got so scorpions just like spiders have got eight legs so you'll see he's got these enormous pincers at the front they're not classed as legs um, but behind these pincers he's got his eight legs four on each side so you see him now moving around really really well with these eight legs and the other animals that we would put into the group of arachnids are the mites and ticks mini mini minuscule animals um, that we don't really see very often so looking at its big pincers a um, bit like a crab has these big pincers like hands for grabbing onto prey to eat and these guys like to prey on any sorts of invertebrates really so we feed them on locusts mealworms crickets we put that in as live prey into their enclosure and the scorpions they can move fairly fast if they want to especially if they're hungry i think i would too 
and they'll use the pincers to grab this live food and then they'll take it to their mouth. Now their mouth is right at the front of their body in the middle here. They've got something called chelicerae, which uh, like these little um, mouth parts that come out and basically take the insect in, um, holding it with its pincers at the same time. Now at the end of the scorpion's body, it's got this long tail and you can see it's got this stinger on the end. So scorpions do have venom. Now luckily this one isn't too venomous for me. If it was to get me with that stinger, it would be very sharp. It's needle sharp at the end there. Uh, but the actual strength of the venom is thought to be very much like a bee sting. Now saying that, I am myself a beekeeper and I don't fare well with a bee sting. Um, so hopefully I'm not gonna get stung today. Um, but saying that, the scorpions we keep here, they are fairly placid that we can hol hold them somewhat. Um, as you can see here, he's, he's quite placid now. He's, he's slowed down a lot as well. Now, scorpions can do something really incredible with their bodies, and that is they can glow like a greeny, bluey colour under ultraviolet light. So you'll see when we shine the ultraviolet light onto the scorpions here, this beautiful, like, greeny, turquoisey colour that they turn out. Um, no one's actually 100% sure why they do this. It is thought that it could attract insects because an insect will see an ultraviolet light. So even flying insects as well, they'll be uh, attracted to the scorpion with this bright light that they see and makes it quite easy for the scorpion then to uh, detect its prey through vibrations and catch it in its pincers. So it's all good news for the scorpion. Um, but like I say, it's, it's actually not really known 100% to science uh, why it is that they glow like this. So I'll talk about a few more areas of the scorpion and it, its body parts. So it's got um, some eyes right on the top of its body here. Now they have a pair of eyes on the top and they've got pairs of like lateral eyes as well. So they can have um, it's thought to be like eight to ten eyes, you know, five pairs often of eyes on their bodies. Um, they've not got great eyesight, so they will feel around for things. They've got very, very fine hairs. Well, I say hairs, more like little tiny, thin bristles, um, especially on their pedipalps, on their pincers here. So that helps detect what's coming around them, whether it's prey, whether it's danger, um, and they can decide what move to make. So they pick up a lot of vibrations and they've got something very special underneath their body as well. Now, I can't really show you that as, as he's walking along, but underneath it's kind of a comb like structure that runs uh, along near the front of their body underneath. Uh, it's called their pectines and this comb like structure as they walk along, it can actually come down and brushes along the ground. So that will also pick up vibrations for them. And this is the way that we would sex the scorpion as well. So we get males and female scorpions and it depends on the size of that comb-like structure as to what sex it is. So we would have to look at this one underneath. Um, I tell you, this one is a male, um, but we would have to, in fact, I might be able to um, bring it up slightly and you can kind of see underneath what it looks like. So you can just, no, he's not enjoying that well uh, um, but underneath he has got his comb light structure these pectines so that brings us to the end of today's session on our nocturnal animals we are gonna now pin on where we've met the scorpion from which is over here southeast asia so i'm just going to find a gap here um where are we there we are indonesia area just there so I hope you've enjoyed learning about all these creatures of the night and seeing them a little bit closer. Um, don't be scared if you do visit us at Amazonia. They are all um, within their enclosures in the nocturnal area. So if you're not keen on the dark, don't worry too much. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed tuning in. We've got some more activity sheets for today's lesson. So please do feel free to download those and complete them. Um, any questions, um, you can contact us through our Facebook page as well. We'd be happy to answer those or see any photos of you doing your homeschooling with us. That would be fantastic as well. But thanks for tuning in again. And we hope to see you next week when we're going to be learning all about the threats to the rainforest. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Thank you.